Well, thank you, and for me, this is basically always about Caroline. And were she here, she'd say, say uh, hope you learned something, and, uh, and um, enjoy yourself, and have a really good time. And I see a lot of familiar faces here that uh, I know these people are capable of doing this, that, so we're in good, <laughs> we're in good hands. And uh, I have uh, always been blessed with not much or uh, small staff, but a very good staff. And uh, Michael Gard, can, uh, can the girls come in for a second? And uh, they, they did so much here, as did the Oklahoma State people. And Dave Lawman uh, really carried a load for us. Uh, Kathy, with, uh, did she work with you, Dave, or whoever? She was yeah. great help. And then we have uh, uh, Sharon, who is in our New Mexico office, and she did most of this. But Annie Powell, has, which she spends time with me in Mississippi and Texas and New Mexico, uh, basically runs my whole business. I, I don't do a lot anymore. I don't, uh, uh, I just, uh, cause problems mostly. There, and there is Violette. Uh, we, she fills in wherever is needed. She's a little bit hard to direct, but she does it on her own, uh, on her own time and gets it done. So thank you. And that's, that's Sharon right there. Thank you all. And that's Kathy behind. And there's Annie. And thank you all so much. And <laughs> And thank the uh, Oklahoma State people so much for everything, um, and, and the people of Oklahoma. We've got a lot of people here, and <coughs> this, is a, this is a state with a, with a lot of history in the cattle industry, and as they say, way down yonder in the Indian nation, cowboy's life was our occupation. and. Uh, we spent, Caroline and I spent a lot of years running from uh, Central and West Texas and New Mexico and even out to California and then back through South and Central uh, Oklahoma just uh, keeping track of our yearlings and our cows and uh, it was good times. A uh, couple things that I, I'm a historian of sorts and the weather changes that we've had this last year have, have, have been incredible, and of course we've wiped out the drought that was sort of the inspiration for a lot of this this uh, uh, confinement thing. But uh, but don't worry, the drought will return. It always has, and it always will. And and uh, unfortunately, our our friends in California are still in. Uh, in, in such an the place I sold is which is in the central coast of California. We had uh, we vacated uh, two years ago, two years and eight months ago on uh, on the th night of the 31st. We had an inch of rain at the place then, and since then uh, this this sounds uh, hard to comprehend, but it's since then they've had two inches of rain in the last two years and eight months, total of two inches of rain. It is, one thing about they don't have to worry about fires because there's nothing growing. And, but we're promised a big El Nino there this year, and uh, which usually brings a really wet year or a series of years. Interesting piece of history, most of you are probably aware that Union County, New Mexico, which is the far northeast corner of, uh, of New Mexico borders <clears throat> on Oklahoma. Uh, they've had a, a, they had a huge drought and they had a huge recovery this last year. Gene Atcherly, whose family came, Gene is 92 years old now, spent all his life except for World War II there uh, in the cattle business, and their family came 
from around Blackwell, Oklahoma, just following a land rush. They participated in the land rush in Oklahoma and then <coughs> went to, uh, to Clayton, New Mexico. And he told me the other day, he said, this is the best year of ever that we've had there in Clayton, New Mexico, which is this country that's noted for probably as good a short grass country as any place in the world. But he said they've had 17 inches of rain since the 1st of June, and, and uh, that's their 15 inch rainfall area annually, so you know how good that is. But the interesting thing, he said, we had one other year that was equal, and he said that was 1941. And uh, and I said, well, that's not long after the Dust Bowl. And he said, yeah, the Dust Bowl, the last ba bad year was 39, and then that's how fast we recovered. And th this is, in a sense, what happened here, if you will. This last, we went, what, five or six years in an incredible drought, and then we've followed that with an incredible amount of rain. And it proves that Weather always changes, and it always has, and it always will. And I'm not a global warming advocate, and I can recall when I started on the dog and pony show circuit in the 70s, the biggest topic then in terms of climate was global cooling. And they were sure that sometime after about 1980, we would not grow any corn any place in the United States north of, uh, of Ohio and northern Iowa and, and so on, and you know how that kind of went. So my point is that times change, times change for our, our concept of, uh, of confinement uh, cow production, which we did out of desperation, uh, and it worked quite well. Uh, interestingly enough, I still have a herd confined in Nebraska or I would say semi-confined in, and actually, because of the inexpensive feed, it's cheaper to run them in the feed yard than it is uh, to, to lease grass at the growing grass rates in, in Nebraska this year, which I wouldn't have expected. And uh, uh, we all enjoyed, uh, again, going back a little bit, we've all enjoyed uh, an incredible year in 19, or excuse me, 2014, when one of the first times on record, all segments of the industry were incredibly profitable simultaneously. This thing is kind of headed south right now, as I'm sure you're all aware of. And we have people that feel happy that we're expanding the cow herd, which I agree we needed to, and it was getting incredibly uh, low and we were, you know, we were going to, we were either going to have to turn it around or, or lose an industry. Uh, but I, I think we need to think about where we're at as we expand. And I know there's lo lots of people who think we'll go back to 35 or 36 million cows and perhaps. And, but there's a new gorilla in the room and that's body weight and size. And we have got a wreck out there right now because average carcass weights for June, or excuse me, September 5th came out this morning, 916 pounds, an all-time record by 10 pounds, 38 pounds or something over last year. We double, excuse me, we increased carcass weights 100 pounds every 20 years for the last 40 years, but at the rate we're going now, we'll increase them 100 pounds in 10 years. And my take home message out there is if we do that, uh, we're not gonna need as many cows as we thought we did. Finally, let me wrap up. Uh, we finished uh, a poem book and somebody said, you've gotta read uh, my favorite poem out of it. And th this is a book I'd, I gathered up all my poems that I'd written mostly in a, in a in the 90s, uh, that's 1990s, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I'd, I'd put them all under, uh, under one cover, uh, all the ones that were worth keeping. And this guy said, 
this, this poem fits right. Now, by the way, I, I can't come back to Oklahoma and not think about one of my professors, which is Bill Pope, who was a good professor, but he's an incredible storyteller. And, and a couple of stories that are pertinent that he told frequently uh, was uh, about the rancher that said, I've seen a thousand changes in my life. And he said, I've been against every damn one of them. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are not very thrilled about confinement cow production, and that's okay. There's room for everybody. Those of you that can adapt to it and it fits, the fact that you can be flexible gives you an enormous advantage. The other, the other thing he always said was he, he got along with the economists okay, but he, he hated statistics because he didn't understand it. And, and he, he said if they took all the economists and statisticians in this business and laid them end to end, he said it would be a good idea. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking about some of the market prognostications that have, we're living or we're, have not come to fruition, let's put it that way right now. Anyway, this, this poem, and we'll finish here, is called Heaven's Feedlot, and uh, it's on page 22 of the book, if you bought the book, but anyway, it's when I finish life's final race, my tired body is laid to rest, they say that heaven will have a place where I can do what I do best. The feedlot life has been my fate, so the Lord should treat me well. He'll braid me through that pearly gate because I served my time in hell. <laughs> Calves will be preconditioned in heaven, and health problems will disappear, and on-time truckers will unload them, and we'll just step atop a temple tag in their ear. We won't need medicine or drugs, but company reps will come anyway, and they'll leave some caps and coffee mugs and take us fishing on Saturday. We'll always have perky feed, thanks to heaven's nutritionist, le or heaven's nutritionist. My old nutritionist I won't, I won't need, but he's still a welcome guest. Send no Holsteins, each trader I'll tell, because bolts and bullers are such a pain, and I know they'll still be hard to sell even in the Lord's domain. Heaven will have only friendly banks, and each week they'll bring more money, and they'll buy us lunch and just say thanks, and their disposition will be funny. With one old problem, we still must deal. It's something the Lord requires. Heaven's high standards are for real, so there's a shortage of Packer buyers. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>